What's up, everyone? This offseason, the Knicks didn't make the splash that a lot of fans hoped that they would. There was no big signings or blockbuster trades. But what the Knicks did do was have a really good draft and sign some solid vets to achieve one-year deals. The Knicks also hired a bunch of assistant coaches who have a strong history of player development. This is how you do a rebuild. The Knicks wisely prioritized the development of their young core, which is what will set this team up for long-term success. So in this video, we're going to do an in-depth analysis of the Knicks roster for the upcoming season in the order of the Knicks depth chart at each position. But before we continue, if you like content like this, please like the video as it really encourages the YouTube algorithm to recommend it to more people. And please subscribe as it really helps my channel grow. Now let's get started. Let's begin with the point guards. The most likely starter for the Knicks at point guard is Alfred Payton. A lot of Knicks fans weren't happy to see Payton back, but he's actually a lot better than people think. Payton is a good playmaker and defender, and the Knicks overall were a better team last year with him on the court. As Jonathan Macri from Knicks Film School posted, the Knicks scored 111.4 points per 100 possessions when Alfred Payton played, and 103.2 points when he sat. The Knicks were better by about 8 points per 100 possessions with Payton on the floor, which goes to show that he makes the team offense a lot more potent. Payton isn't a long-term answer at point guard, but he can hold it down for the upcoming year. The Knicks will land their point guard of the future, either by trade or in next year's draft. Backing up Payton is likely Frank Nilekina. Nilekina has potential to be a good starter, but his game hasn't developed enough to reach that level. Yes, he's a very good defender. Thanks to his size and length, he can defend multiple positions, and we've even seen flashes of Frank making defensive plays on the league's top players like Luka Doncic. Frank is a great defender, but what's held him back is his offense. This year, Frank only averaged six points and three assists a game, on 39% shooting from the field and 32% from three. Frank needs to be a lot more productive on the offensive end. If he was to develop a respectable three-point shot, he could be a good 3 and D player. I expect Frank to be Peyton's backup this year, where he'll likely receive 20 to 25 minutes a game. Frank is headed into a contract year, so hopefully that motivates him to improve. Last on the depth chart is DSJ, where I don't expect him to be in the rotation this year. Dennis Smith Jr. might have been the worst player in the league last year. He was so bad that he became the first player in league history to shoot below 35% from the floor, 30% from three, and 50% from the free throw line. He was a complete train wreck on both ends of the floor last season. Honestly, the Knicks should have just traded DSJ at last year's trade deadline for whatever asset they could have gotten because I don't think he has a future on this team. I think he's going to end up getting buried behind Peyton and Frank and barely play at all next season. Next, let's get to shooting guards. RJ Barrett will likely get the start here at the two. Considering the conditions around him, RJ had a good rookie year and it's complete BS he was left off all rookie team. RJ averaged 14 points, five boards, and 2.6 assists a game, which are good numbers for a rookie. Now his shooting percentages were pretty awful. He only shot 40% from the field last year, but that was in large part due to the fact that he was playing with the worst spacing in the league. Too often, RJ had to drive into a wall of defenders, which forced him into tough, difficult shots. RJ knows his weaknesses, which is why he spent the offseason working on his jumper and working on his handles and shiftiness. I expect RJ to have a better year in his sophomore season, and hopefully by year three or four, he'll make that all-star leap. Next on the depth chart at the two guard is Austin Rivers. Now Rivers is listed as a combo guard, but I believe he'll mostly play the two for the Knicks. He isn't much of a playmaker as his career assist average is only 2.3 assists per game, and the Knicks are loaded at point guard. Rivers may not be much of a playmaker, but he's someone that's a threat to have a good scoring night any game. He also gives the Knicks some shooting as he shot 36% from three for Houston last year. He's also a solid defender. Overall, he will be a nice spark plug for the Knicks off the bench. 
Last on the depth chart at the two spot is Emmanuel Quickly. The Knicks selected Quickly with a 25th pick in the NBA draft out of Kentucky. The main reason why the Knicks probably made this pick is because last year there was a lack of shooting, but with Quickly, they get one of the top shooters in the draft. Quickly shot 43% from three for Kentucky on about five attempts a game, and he shot a super high 92% from the free throw line. Quickly may only be 6'3", but he's another player who I think is really more of a two guard at the NBA level. Unfortunately, unless there's injuries, I think he gets buried on the depth chart behind RJ and Austin Rivers. Quickly is good, but Thibodeau historically isn't a coach that plays rookies just for the sake of development. He usually tends to favor his veterans. Next, we'll move on to small forwards. The most likely starter at the three here is Alec Burks. Alec Burks is an instant upgrade at the three spot for the Knicks. Burks is an excellent shooter as he shot 38% from three last year and 88% from the free throw line. His ability to space the floor will help to create driving lanes for guys like RJ Barrett. Along with the floor spacing, Burks will also contribute as a scorer and a playmaker. As a veteran on a bad team, there's a good chance Burks may put up career highs, which will allow the Knicks to trade him at the deadline for a draft pick, which is similar to what they did with Marcus Morris last year. Next on the death chart at the three is Reggie Bullock. It isn't shocking that the Knicks chose to keep Bullock as his team option for this year was dirt cheap at just 4 million. And he's a solid fit on the team because he's a good three and D player. Bullock only shot 33% from three last year but that's because he was coming off spinal surgery. He's a career 38% three-point shooter, so fans should expect that his percentages will go up this year. Bullock is another guy who the Knicks might be able to flip at the deadline for a pick because contenders always need players like him. Next on the depth chart at the three is Kevin Knox. Knox is headed into an important third year. Last year, he regressed so it's imperative that he shows improvement if he wants to have a long NBA career. Unfortunately, with the veterans ahead of him, I think Knox will find himself out the rotation this year. I know a lot of fans want to see Knox on the court, but as I said before, Tibbs tends to favor veterans that he thinks will help him win games. Instead of rotting on the bench, I think Kevin Knox should spend time in the G League. If Knox dominates while playing in Westchester, it'll do wonders for his confidence. Hopefully, if guys like Bullock or Burks get traded at the den line, it'll open up a spot in the rotation for Knox. Knox just needs to stay prepared for when his number is finally called. Ignaz Brasdekis is next on the depth chart, and he's another guy that deserves playing time, but won't play too much because of the veterans ahead of him. Iggy dominated in the G League last year, where he was averaging 21 points per game. In the G League, he showed a good all-around offensive game. He could shoot the three ball, he could create his own shot off the dribble, and he's a strong finisher around the basket. Iggy also made strides as a defender and playmaker while down in the G League. Iggy can be a strong spark plug off the bench. He just needs an opportunity. Unfortunately, opportunities will be hard to come by for Iggy with the veterans ahead of him. Hopefully, if some guys get traded at the deadline, Iggy will finally get a chance to make an impact. Next, we move on to power forwards. Obi Toppin will more than likely get the start here at the four. Some fans think that Randall will get the start, but I think that Toppin will end up winning it. He fits more from a basketball perspective with the starting unit, as unlike Randall, Toppin is a legit stretch four. Toppin shot 39% from three for Dayton, while Randall shot 27% from three for the Knicks last year. The Knicks need a stretch four next to RJ Barrett and Mitchell Robinson, and along with the excellent shooting, Toppin is a phenomenal vertical athlete, which he tends to display often with highlight reel dunks. Toppin, who is the number eight pick, is the future of this team, so expect Thibodeau to start Toppin on opening night. Backing up Toppin will be Julius Randle. Last year, Randle had a rough first year with the Knicks. He was coming off a year where he averaged 21 and eight, so the Knicks thought they landed an all-star caliber player. Unfortunately, Randall's numbers make him seem a lot better than he is. Yes, he's a 20 and 10 machine, but he should never be a team's number one or even a number two option. Randall has a rock bottom basketball IQ, so when he's faced with increased defensive pressure, he becomes a turnover machine. 
Randall may not be an all-star level player, but I think he could be a really good six man. Especially when paired with a playmaking guard, Randall could be deadly scoring off cuts to the basket and out of the pick and roll. Julius Randall's role on the Knicks should essentially be similar to Montrezl Harrell's role for the Clippers last year. If Randall was to embrace that second unit role, I think he could be sixth man of the year. Finally, we move on to center, where Mitchell Robinson will likely get the start. Mitch was selected with a 36th pick in the 2018 draft, and since then he's been a steal. Mitch is already an elite defensive center. He's one of the league's top shot blockers, he's also an amazing pick and roll defender, and thanks to his agility, he can hold his own when switched onto a perimeter player. Offensively, Mitch is pretty one-dimensional, but thanks to his size and athleticism, he's an amazing finisher. He even broke Wilt Chamberlain's record for the highest field goal percentage in league history, where he shot 74% from the field this year. If Mitchell Robinson could just stay out of foul trouble, the Knicks could play him starter minutes. The Knicks brought in Kenny Payne from Kentucky, who's known as the big man whisperer because of the work he's done with other bigs coming out of Kentucky, including Carl Anthony Towns and Bam Adebayo. Hopefully, working with Kenny Payne in practice will help Mitchell Robinson make a leap this year. And last on the death chart at center is Nerlens Noel, another Kentucky product. Most fans consider Nerlens Noel a bust, but he's become an excellent backup center behind Steven Adams the past couple of years. Adding Noel is almost like having two Mitchell Robinsons for the Knicks. He's a little bit shorter at 6'11", but Noel is an amazing defender. He's one of the top rim protectors in the league, he could switch on the perimeter players, and he even plays the passing lanes really well where he tends to get a lot of steals. And offensively, Noel is a great finisher around the basket. Adding Noel should really improve the Knicks team defense because having him means the Knicks will have 48 minutes of elite rim protection. When Mitch sits, the Knicks will still have an elite defensive center on the floor. And with that said, guys, that's going to be the end of the video. Do you think this is what the Knicks rotation will look like when the season starts? Tell me in the comments. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe and enjoy the rest of your day.